Hi guys, it is a smoky, hazy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization in the Green Mountains of Vermont here in the middle of the summer of 2019, but we are going to leave New England and we're going to head today to Old England where I have the pleasure and honor of speaking with Dr. James Dyke and there you may remember this essay that I read recently by James uh, which we're going to be talking a lot about in this interview but to refresh your memory Dr. James Dyke is an academic writer and public speaker based in the United Kingdom he is a senior lecturer at the Global Systems Institute at the University of Exeter. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, a member of the European Geophysical Union, and serves on the editorial board of the journal Earth System Dynamics. He has co-authored over 35 peer-reviewed science papers and book chapters, and he's now working on a full book and over 40 popular science and environmental articles where you have probably heard uh, from James if you're down in this rabbit hole. He is also the presenter and co-producer of the documentary feature The Race is On, Secrets and Solutions of climate change and guys I could go on and on with this all day long but uh, let's just move ahead so James Dyke come on board and say hello to the folks and we're gonna dive right into this well uh, hello and thank you so much for inviting me I'm really looking forward to our conversation today okay and as I just mentioned folks uh, you, you might remember where about three weeks ago I read this essay that James Dyke uh, had published in both The Conversation and The Independent where they chose the headline, We have created a civilization hell-bent on destroying itself. I am terrified. And we're just going to start right there and we are pretty much, I'm going to put the link again to this excellent essay which really boils down what we talk about on Collapse Chronicles. So let's start with the title. Uh, James Dyke, have we created a, a civilization hell-bent on destroying itself, and why are you terrified? Well, uh, the short answer to the first part of that question is yes. I think we have created a civilization that's certainly on a path to what we might consider to be self-destruction. Um, and I suppose the reason that I wrote that article is that I was becoming increasingly frustrated about the, the, the discussion in public, so the way in which these issues were being reported, you know, the narratives that are being told about climate change or biodiversity loss or ocean plastics, but then also how the science was increasingly compartmentalized about this and that we, we look at only a very, very small section of the problem and I think there's a real need that we need to take a step back, maybe, you know, this kind of mythical view from space where we look at the Earth as a system and we see what humans are doing within that system and how that system functions. And I think when we do do that, and certainly I think some very influential scholars have already attempted that, we see something which we can call this thing, which, which is um, I refer to as the technosphere, and the dynamics of this sort of voracious thing which is increasing in size and scope and power and is going to produce impacts that, if we're not careful, are going to be very bad for humans and their well-being and welfare for potentially a very long period of time. Well, since you have already introduced the term the technosphere, this is really what I want to base this this interview on. If we have time at, at, at the end of the discussion on the technosphere to touch on some other things. So let's start out with a with a definition. What is your working definition of the word technosphere and connect some dots between it and the possible collapse of civilization in the planet? So the way that I would use the word technosphere is quite similar to the way that 
the US scientist Peter Haff would use the word technosphere. I think it was Peter that coined the word technosphere. And other people use it slightly differently, but I think there's a common agreement that the technosphere encompasses both the, the physical, the, the, the biophysical aspects of the Earth system, so we can see it encompassing the geosphere, the movement of you know, tectonic plates, the hydrosphere, the dynamics of the ocean, the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the biosphere, life on it. But then importantly, human civilization, the technology that we have built, the infrastructure, the artifacts that we've built. And that entire system now we call the technosphere. So if we were, again, imagine we're in space looking down at the Earth and maybe we're in orbit around the Earth. Um, we are regarding the Earth as it was, let's say, 10,000 years ago. You know, there were Homo sapiens that wrote the Earth uh, on that period of time, during that period of time, but there was nothing like a civilization that we understand it now. So you would be able to describe the Earth system, how it functions, how it changes and evolves over time, using concepts from, you know, geology, biology, climatology. What humans have done, and I think they've done it completely unwittingly, they've produced this planetary scale technological civilization, which means that the way the Earth works, the way that the Earth functions now is importantly different. And so we need a, a different level of exploration. We need a different sort of perspective. We need entirely new tools and methodologies and maybe even sorts of epistemologies. And one way of trying to capture that great big new basket of dynamics and per perceptions and perspective is something that we call the technosphere. So, one of these real famous, uh, well, I don't guess it's one photo, you can find this all over YouTube, it's when these satellites, particularly at night, yeah. are, are beaming, are, are photographing Earth and just looking at the lights, just, just looking at pretty much city lights, how you can define entire coastlines out of the pitch black dark, that would certainly be a, a def, an example of what you're talking about, how humans have fundamentally created a new sphere on this planet. Uh, would that yeah. Be, yeah. I mean, literally, that's the most visible way that we, we see it. So when you see these beautiful time-lapse videos from the International Space Station, and it, and it goes over the Terminator, and you, you go from the looking down over, you know, clouds and deep blue azure oceans and then barren land, and then you, you plunge into darkness, and then you see the, the outlines of countries and continents resolve themselves in that kind of orange sodium light, because many centers of population are around the coasts and that's where awful lots of lights are but then extending inland there's very few regions now where you don't see significant light or light light pollution so that's the visible way in which we can see literally the technosphere but the thing that's really interesting about the technosphere or, or perhaps even frightening is that it's so embedded in the earth system processes it's so embedded literally in the ground and it's having impacts and interactions with the oceans and the atmosphere that it's developing in ways which are going to produce changes in the Earth system, which are generally agreed and understood to be potentially catastrophic for us, for, for the humans who seem to have made this thing in the first place. So give us some uh, uh, exa examples of, of what you just mentioned, of the potential catastrophes we have created for ourselves that we need to figure out a way to uh, get ourselves out of. Well, yeah, everyone's talking about climate change, and rightly so, because it's it's something we can measure. It's a very discrete kind of measurement. Um, well, it gets rendered down to a very discrete measurement, you know, average increase of surface temperatures uh, since the pre-industrial period. And we can assign numbers to what we think is safe, anything below two degrees Celsius, and then we can think about anything that would be dangerous <clears throat> and potentially apocalyptic beyond five, six, or seven. But that's just one thing that we're doing. So what I try to do uh, in some of my, I suppose, teaching and also my um, my my writing and um, public communication of these issues is to discuss the planetary boundaries framework, because I think that's a really useful way of looking at what humans are doing or what even the technosphere is doing. 
And the planetary boundaries kind of arrived in, from a workshop in back in 2009, uh, and it was chaired by a guy called Johan Rockström, who was then the sort of the director of the Stockholm Resilience Centre. And it was like a who's who of Earth system scientists and sustainability scientists and people who have been working for literally decades on enumerating and evaluating the ways that humans and our civilization was changing the Earth system. <clears throat> And they visualized, <clears throat> an important visualization was, I'm just going to drink my water, excuse me. This is why I always ask my guests to bring uh, glasses of water with them. I have now drunk my water. All right. Um, Charge ahead and with the planetary boundaries. And... Okay. So there are nine planetary boundaries. And there's a famous diagram of the planetary boundaries. So you, you need to imagine a circle. And there are kind of, it's like, cut up into a, uh, it's like a pie that's cut up into nine slices, mm -hmm. and each slice represents a planetary boundary, so we've got a planetary boundary, I'm not going to list them all, don't worry, but we've got one for climate change, biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, uh, biogeochemical disruption, which is the disruption of phosphorus and nitrogen, um, novel entities, uh, aerosols, um, ozone, stratospheric ozone depletion, and then we imagine um, that we can sort of measure the impacts that humans are having on those nine different um, boundaries by a kind of a colouring in the, the wedges or the slices as they come out from, from the centre. So if we're, basically, if we're not really having much of an impact, we imagine only the, the very centre point is coloured in. So, for example, stratospheric uh, ozone depletion, Everyone's pretty well. Most people are pretty relaxed about that. We seem to have gotten a grip on the thinning of the ozone layer because we've managed to limit the widespread production of um, ozone depleting substances like CFCs. But when you look at climate change, well, that most of that that kind of slice is completely coloured in and it's coloured in kind of orange or red. But the interesting thing about planetary boundaries or that way of looking at the Earth system is that that's not actually the greatest cause for concern. The biggest cause for concern is the biodiversity loss, the rate of the loss of species and also the destruction of ecosystems. How much of that, that wedge is, co is colored in here halfway through 2019? Have we hit, and I agree with you, it's the biodiversity piece of the pie that, that is the most uh, terrifying to me personally. How close have we come to eating that piece of the pie? And what does it mean if we, if we quote, exceed that boundary? Yeah, so there's, there's kind of, they, they imagine three graduations or three different ways we could classify our impacts. The first one is no immediate cause for concern. The second one is we are approaching the zone of uncertainty. And the second one is we're well outside of any kind of safe zone. And so for biodiversity, we're well outside of any safe zone. And in this kind of famous 2009 rendering, they color in that slice and then the coloring goes well beyond the actual slice itself. It kind of off the page because the rates, the rates of species lost are, are so high and also habitat destruction are so high. So what what is it? What is your vision of, of how the sixth mass extinction is going to be unfolding? Is there... It, it, you know, my, 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 I, I just can't imagine any uh, large megafauna surviving in sub-Saharan Africa by the end of this century. I don't, I don't see it in the cards. I, I see every single individual elephant, rhino, giraffe, lion, you know what I'm saying, in the stew mm -hmm. pot, if nothing else. Uh, I mean, how bad is this going to get, and, and how bad can it get before we're on the same chopping block as everyone else that we've put on the chopping block? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because I think it, if we follow through the answer or one possible answer, I think we arrive at one of the reasons why I am so concerned about our predicament. Um, and so this, I hope this isn't going to be a rambling answer, and feel free ramble to interrupt on, at any time. Ramble on, brother. You got, you got the floor here. So, okay, so one, one scenario is that we continue to degrade and destroy ecosystems and increase, or just even maintain the rate of species loss, and then something bad is going to happen. But 
there's an important perspective that we need to take, and, and that is that we already live in a highly degraded uh, biosphere with regards to megafauna. So just where I, I live on the south coast of England, and obviously the climate in, in this region has changed significantly as a consequence of glacials and interglacials in the ice ages, but it wasn't so long ago that wolves roamed these lands along with bears, along with lions, along with many other uh, megafauna, basically the big mammals. And that's the same across Europe and that's the same across North America. What happened is that all that megafauna disappeared. And it's been a long running debate about the causes of that because it was first, well, one theory was the disappearance of megafauna in, in northern Europe, um, actually most of Europe, and then also North America, was importantly associated with ecological change as a consequence of the ice ages. And so the, the, um, the, uh, the commencement and the ending of ice ages can be relatively rapid. That produces quite rapid environmental change. And so the reason that we see, for example, towards the end, um, of the last ice ages, the ice sheets were kind of retreating and we see the disappearance of megafauna across large parts of the northern hemisphere. Well, you know, it's just a largely a consequence of environmental change. But it's, I think, becoming increasingly uh, plausible that the reason we see these large mammals and other species disappear is because humans arrive on the scene and exactly. it's the dispersion of humans across Europe and then, you know, land bridges into North America. So we already live in a world that's massively denuded of megafauna, certainly big, big mammals, because we've either eaten them all or we've killed them all because they were either trying to eat the things that we want to eat or in some instances they were either eating us. And so what we're left with now are these pretty pathetic patches, these little refugia in regions of the earth where the only reason they're there is because those regions haven't undertaken anything like the rates of industrialization, development, and increasing population density that other places have. And so there's literally space for them. So in one respect, if we see, you know, the last African elephants disappear, or, you know, uh, already we see these, what used to be magnificent herds of wildebeest, you know, completely uh, eradicated, in some respects, you might say, well, you know, 90% of it was gone already and you know, we're still hanging on. Because what's really happened, I think, is the development of our civilization, it sort of, it sort of liquidated a significant fraction of the biosphere. It's literally been fed into this kind of ever increasing more of our civilization in the form of sometimes... Uh, directly for our consumption. So one of the challenges right now in Africa is bushmeat, increasing populations and you know hunting or sometimes poaching in order to actually eat the animals for for your you know nutrition and calories. But more importantly, the consumption of land, um, the destruction of let's say rainforests to uh, ranch cattle, or the clearing of other ecosystems in order to produce crops which we can grow intensively and therefore feed the current population of, you know, over seven and a half billion. And it's the end point of that. So in one respect, you might say, well, you know, plus de change, because we've been doing this for, you know, at least, you know, a couple of thousand years or so. But we may be getting to the point where there's literally nothing left in order to liquidate. You know, we, we are we are we are we're coming to the end of the line of the process by which we can just continually convert biodiversity or types of ecosystem functioning into something that we consider to be productive for our civilization. And then when we hit that limit, it's hard to see how we can continue. Well, it's certainly hard to see how we can continue that trajectory. And then the question is, of course, what happens next? What and is on the other? Now, do you, uh, I, I, I hate it when people ask me this question, so I, I'm kind of embarrassed by asking you, but I know you've heard it a million times. What is yeah. your best estimate when we are going to hit the wall, the, the fabled limits to growth? Uh, do you put this on a timeline or is it not that important to you? It's just, it's just more what it's going to look like than when it's going to happen. Or, do, or are you willing to go out on a limb and say how many years we have under this model? Yeah. Um... 
Well, not surprisingly, I'm not going to give you a date, right? <laughs> so uh, some people the, do. Some people have no problem, but but you're not going to uh, you're not going to walk into that trap, James. Okay, I shall not be drawn. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm very interested in the limits to go study. The, so the original model, I mean, we were talking all the way back in 1972, and at the time, that was it was groundbreaking, that, that research. Uh, it was the first kind of system dynamics model. It was the first sort of computational approach to this. Um, many people hated it. Economists hated it, of oh, course, because yeah. it just, didn't, you know, just limits to growth is something that would uh, upset many economists um, because there's a kind of ideological flavor to that, to their... Um, to their discomfort with saying there are limits to growth. But the thing about limits to growth is that it was obviously a necessarily very simple model, but it, I think its main limitation, it was it modeled just a single kind of homogenous blob with regards to the global population. There was just, you know, a global population which has global impacts and suffers the consequences of those impacts globally. Whereas what we see is a much, much, differentiated and certainly unequal world where we could very crude if we were to make a, a limits to growth model today for example um, and a very simple one there would be an industrialized rich north and a either not industrialized or industrializing global poor south and the issue that we have right now is that most of the let's say just in the context of climate, most of the impacts are coming from the globalized north and most of the effects of those impacts are going to be felt by that global south. So what this means is that the global north is essentially insulated or protected from the impacts of its own behavior because it's literally not going to suffer. I mean, right now, just climate change is killing people. There, there's been, there has been an increase in the frequency of extreme weather events in the, in the terms of, let's say, heat waves and so people are dying. The argument was always and will always remain, I think, until, until the end of whatever we consider to be civilization. But those deaths were essentially worth it because those deaths came as a consequence of climate change, which came as a consequence of economic growth, which produces wealth, which can make lives better. So there were kind of there was sort of collateral damage in, in some respects. They were, they were regrettable, but in some respects, they were the unavoidable deaths of a system which must continue to grow in order that it continues to produce wealth and goods and services that makes everyone's lives better. And I suppose for a while you can make that argument, but when you look at sort of spiraling inequality and, you know, the, the hyper-consumption which is occurring in these industrialised nations... I don't think it's very controversial to make the observation that perhaps some of the wealth that's being produced by this civilization is not being um, distributed very equitably. And there is a massive difference in the kind of impacts and consequences that we're going to get. So in some respects, now this is going to answer your question. So in some respects, if we're looking for the point of the complete collapse of what we consider to be our industrialized, globalized civilization, I can see scenarios in which that happen. Uh, in fact, I was thinking about them today. Um, Let's hear it. But, yeah, but we might be missing something just as important, which is potentially significant impacts in, let's say, um, some of the regions of the, the global industrialized or industrializing south who are much more vulnerable to environmental change um, and could be suffering the consequences of our quite profligate lifestyles quite some time before we do. <laughs> Well, well that, that that that's pr pretty obvious uh, well I, I'm thinking may, maybe I'm just being a naive uh, privileged uh, American that uh, we're, we're, we're gonna be the last to fall uh, but it, it, it's not going to start here even but even if it ends here it's eventually going to work our way this way and, and, and the flip side you know obviously is the in You've used the term the industrializing, the the non-industrial, the what are now non-industrial countries. They're doing everything in their power to change that. I mean, we can we don't even need to get into this whole Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, mm -hmm. uh, which right there to me is that that's the end. Uh, all you got to do is look no further than that. But every country that's not industrial is doing everything they can to become 
uh, the, the industrialized north. And, you know, at some point we are going to hit that inflection point. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going completely the wrong direction. Do you agree with my uh, analysis of, of what's unfolding in front of our very eyes? Um, well, the situation seems to be that we're doubling down on growth and we're doubling down on development because the assumption is, well, this is the reasoning. So the reasoning is the vulnerabilities to environmental change however it may come through various you know, operations, and it's going to be a wide spectrum of impacts, but the vulnerabilities to in, um, environmental change are importantly determined by how rich or poor you are. So if you live in a rich nation and you've got loads of money, you can literally turn your air conditioning up and survive in a climate which would be very, very challenging, uh, if not lethal, actually. I mean, you think about um, large sort of subterranean dwellings or maybe even entire communities. And so sometimes you hear this, this um, claim, I find it vacuous and irritating, but it is made that, you know, um, climate does not determine human habitation, that, you know, people can live and prosper in climates such as Singapore or, or, or Tokyo, which has got very high humidity and heat, and also a, a range of, you know, environmental uh, risks such as tsunamis or earthquakes. So the argument is, look, in order to make sure we reduce vulnerabilities and, and reduce the number of people who are going to be harmed or even killed by things such as extreme heat waves or, you know, uh, extreme storms and flooding as a consequence of sea level rise, we just may, need to make them richer. And the way we make them richer is we keep the engine of growth humming along. And in those developing nations, so uh, let's, let's take China, which you just mentioned, China is completely committed to a course of, you know, rapid increase in the size of its economy. You know, rates of growth of the size of the economy, annual rates of increase to four, five, six, seven percent. You know, seven percent target targets of growth, which would give a central banker in Europe or or America, you know, a heart attack because of the kind of inflationary pressures that would produce. And that growth is there in order to try to essentially outrun the consequences of that growth. So when it really does kick off by the middle of this century, or maybe perhaps towards the end of this century, they'll be sufficiently insulated, they'll have sufficient wealth and capacity and resource and infrastructure that they'll be able to, in some places, literally keep the seas at bay through increasing the size of seawalls or ensuring that they can undertake you know, more protection of critical infrastructure or work out how they can harden food security uh, and agricultural processes. And you can see why they would want to believe a story like that, but I just don't think there is any evidence. I certainly don't think there's any evidence from, let's say, economics or um, ecological economics or the integrated assessment modeling exercises, which sort of uh, underpin an awful lot of that analysis. There's no evidence there that that story is any way coherent and represents, I think, a tremendous risk um, and obviously, of course, tremendously hubristic. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I mean, clearly, clearly. I anyway, we are, We I see we are already halfway through this. As much as I want to <clears throat> stay, stay with this line of conversation, I, I, I want to steer it a little bit more uh, to to this whole concept that a lot of people down here in the Duma sphere are uh, familiar with, and that's this whole concept that we are born into this system with a capital S, this this machine with a capital M that we are cogs in a wheel. Mm -hmm. And uh, that there's nothing at this point, that the system is so much bigger than the sum of its parts. I, I just want to quote briefly from this, uh, this essay that I'm so uh, uh, enraptured with. <clears throat> the idea that growth is ultimately beyond our unsustainable civilization is not a new concept. And then you, you mentioned Malthus, of course, and limits mm -hmm. to growth. And then we get on to, so if growth is the problem, then we just have to work at that, right? 
that this mm -hmm. will not be easy as growth is baked into every aspect of politics and economics. My fear is that we will not be able to slow down the growth of the technosphere even if we tried because we are not actually in control. And I want you to run with that last phrase about how we are not, that we have just created a system completely out of, out of control at this point. And there's not a damn thing that anyone from individual lifestyle and consumer choices right on up is going to be able to do about this and it's just going to have to crash and burn under its own weight. So take a run with this whole idea that we are no longer in control of the technosphere that we have built. Yeah, it's a, it's a provocative idea, let's say, and it's one that I do struggle with to a certain extent because if it's true, you know, then we are doomed and then nothing we do matters. And so we might as well give up. And I do remain stubbornly optimistic. So I'm open to the charge that I am in denial myself on various levels. And I'm, given that I'm meant to be reasonably knowledgeable about the kind of threats or impacts uh, that we face, then I might be undertaking some kind of supercharged denial by, you know, just refusing to accept that we are a completely lost case. So I need to I need to preface this explanation with that. Most people assume that because human beings built our technological civilization, the thing that we can call the technosphere, let's say, they somehow must be in control of it. Because we build cars, uh, we drive cars, and therefore we control cars, and obviously it's an awful lot more complicated uh, and we have to invoke many, many more, more scales, temporal and spatial scales, that humans are somehow in control of our industrialized civilization, the technosphere. And I suppose that I never really critically engaged with the idea that that was not the case. I had, um, I mean, it goes back to the, that, that kind of hoary old question from kind of history. To what extent does any one individual matter, right? You know, if, 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 you know, if, if Hitler had never lived, would we have seen the, you know, the, the apocalypse of the Second World War if, or if certain events in history had unfolded differently? What what could have happened? And those kind of stories obviously uh, center around in those respects, you know, individuals or individual events. They seem to assume that humans have tremendous agency and that what happens, what unfolds over time is largely determined by the way that we act. The technosphere challenges us in a really fundamental way because it says that we're not actually in control. We might think we're in control, but we're not. And in some respects, when you just begin to allow yourself to consider that as a possibility, you begin to see potential new insights into, well, okay, what well, if that is the case, then it would certainly explain why humanity has been unable to stop the inexorable increase in the uh, rate of emissions of greenhouse gases and also the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere because CO2 emissions are closely associated with economic performance as measured by gross domestic product, let's say, and that economic performance is still largely determined by how much fossil fuels we burn in the, in the context of coal, oil and gas, because we're still largely a fossil fuel powered civilization. The, the technosphere still eats, it still consumes fossil fuels and it still, still produces waste in the form of greenhouse gases and pretty much all the other effluent that, that our civilization produces, you know, from old mattresses to plastic bags to all the kind of junk. So when you begin to think about it like that rather than rather than assume that we are in control you can flip it around and you can say well what evidence is there that we are in control what evidence do you have that the coming and going of different politicians or political parties or nation states or even what we consider to be the great moments in history in wars and famines and displacements has any real impact on the development of the technosphere? And when I started to ask myself that question, 
and I started to think about well, what kind of what kind of evidence would I would I use? Where would I get that data? I kind of realised that I couldn't. I um, it was quite hard. I it was you could see bumps in the road, right? You could see how sometimes an event like the Spanish flu or the First World War would have really big impacts in Europe. How the um, um, particular kind of environmental change over decades or centuries could have, you know, big impacts on maybe the northern hemisphere or sometimes the southern, southern hemisphere. But this idea of this kind of inexorably increasing technosphere um, was one that I just couldn't really refute, or I couldn't say that this clearly false. And but perhaps more importantly, I couldn't come up with much evidence that we really are in control. It's easier to find evidence that we're out of, I mean, Terence McKenna, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with Terence, I mean, this was his rap uh, now 25 years ago, Terence mm -hmm. was, was, McKenna was, was having this very discussion 25 years ago. Uh, and he could not, I mean, when the internet was just coming on that this system has gotten completely that anyone who acts like we're in control of this system 25 years ago uh, was deluding themselves. And anyway, I want to, uh, I, again, as, as I say, there, there's so much I want to run down, but I do need some clarification on, on one point uh, in, this, in this essay. I, I think I understand what you're striving at, but I, I'm, I'm going to read uh, this and, and get you to uh, clear this up for me. All right, but let's start here. As, de as defined so far, you know, in, in this excellent essay and what we've been talking about today, as defined so far, there appears nothing to stop the technosphere from liquidating most of the Earth's biosphere to satisfy its growth. Just as long as goods and services are consumed, the technosphere can continue to grow. And so, those who fear the collapse of civilization, or those who have enduring faith in human innovation being able to solve all sustainability challenges, may both be wrong. Well, I clearly understand the second one. Uh, how those who have enduring faith in human innovation being able to solve all sustainability challenges may be wrong, but how are those of us, including the person talking to you, uh, fear the collapse of civilization? How are we wrong? Yeah, that's such an wrong? yeah. It, that is such an interesting question, and it's one that I I do want to explore. At some depth. <laughs> and, Let's um, do it because I, 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 I tell me why I and probably at least half the people listening this, uh, I'm not sure fear the collapse of civil, but, but understand the collapse of civil. Why, why? How could we be wrong at this point? Well, the, you're going to think this is a cheap shot, right? But because I think it might hinge on what we, how we define civilization, okay. right? And in some, in some respects. That's well, you know, if you define something differently, then then um, you're not you're not playing the same game. But this isn't just an issue of definitions. I think this might get really to the heart of it, and this is why I think I, this is such an interesting question because this is really why I, I am worried. It's yeah. obviously I should be worried about the collapse of what we consider to be civilization, but I don't think people really understand what that collapse would be because I think civilization or the technosphere can and may even will or it's more probable that it will continue because it's going to reconfigure and change itself in a way that would allow us to conclude that civilization has continued but would produce what i can what i call this repugnant conclusion it would be a kind of future world that if we were to look at it if we were to be parachuted into it i think we would we would recoil in horror because what one possible scenario is that as we experience limits to growth or um, limits to our ability to continue to extract resources of consequence of climate change, we have to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere. And the way in which all this, 
the uh, parties to the Paris Agreement from 2015, uh, which agreed to limit warming to no more than two degrees Celsius. Everyone has signed up to this idea of negative emissions technologies, our ability to suck out carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere in prodigious quantities. And of those scenarios, pretty much all of them use something called BECS, which is bioenergy carbon capture storage, which is basically growing trees, which you then burn in power stations to generate electricity, capture the CO2 from the chimney stacks, compress it, put it underground, where it has to stay for thousands of years. And what that will do, that will give you electricity, but also because the trees absorb carbon dioxide as they grow and you're capturing it when you burn it, it can suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. So you think, great, right? We're able to produce electricity at the same time as reducing the amount of carbon dioxide. That must be wonderful. And then you do the analysis of how much land you're going to need yeah. to grow yeah. all those trees at the same time as grow all your food, at the same time as having to adapt to the increasing sea level rise and at the same time as having to adapt to, you know, extreme heat and changes in the distribution of human populations and when you can grow anything. And every time you see that happening, you see a scenario where we just adapt and we put extra pressure somewhere else. Now, one, one scenario that you can't discount is that we are going to get a handle on climate change, but not before it increases temperatures beyond approaching or beyond four degrees Celsius to pre-industrial uh, levels. And what does that mean in the, in the context of the Earth? Well, it means significant regions are uninhabitable for humans just because it's too hot and you can't grow anything. There'll be too much water stress. But when you do modeling, I mean, this is really kind of back of the envelope modeling or maybe just thought experiments, you can accommodate humans in Canada, in Greenland, in Northern Europe, uh, maybe also in Antarctica, because a lot of that ice sheet is going to go. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of do the math and see how you can grow food and how you can have people in those areas with what we consider to be pretty much Western style lifestyles. You know, um, they've got, you know, houses and air conditioning and they've got good nutrition and they've got recreational facilities. You can you can see how we've sort of made it. So you think, well, okay, civilization didn't collapse. We made it. We, we made it through this bottleneck, but through the process of innovation and massive disruption, you know, complete reorganization of what we think our current globalized, industrialized civilization is, we made it. But then you look at how many made it. Exactly. And so you're, not, you're not describing a, a, a planet of 10 billion people. No, right? When you look... When, yeah, when you look at the numbers, you're looking at a, pop, a global population in the orders of hundreds of millions of people, maybe half a billion people. That you uh, see the, uh, the population, I mean, by, by what year are we talking about? 2100, well, 2050? Yeah, well, that's the $6 million yeah. question, right? Because if, if this change is slow and progressive, if it takes centuries to reach 4 degrees Celsius, then you can begin to see how there could be, well, actually, no, I don't really begin to see, but one could argue that there could be some sort of managed retreat to that kind of situation. I, I, can't, I can't be, you know, I can't discount the risks that beyond a certain amount of warming, we will see further application through these, you know, the so-called tipping points. So a lot of my colleagues work on tipping points. I mean, some of them came, you know, basically uh, established the idea of tipping points in the climate system. And they are always incredibly reticent to say tipping point X will start at temperature Y because we really don't know. We just don't know. Um, and some people would claim that we already see tipping points. It might be in hindsight that we that we did. But there just isn't the evidence to say that anything is happening now or that we are likely to see a particular tipping point, a particular kind of temperature. But if you push them, they will absolutely say that beyond a certain level of warming, it's increasingly likely that we'll see the amplification of, of warming and we'll see a potentially very rapid increase in temperatures. So there are some scenarios where we'd see four degrees Celsius, you know, within a century, which you might think is extreme. And it, and it might be extreme, but it lays within the kind of the envelope of probability. I don't and if think that... it's extreme at all, but uh, people listening to this will uh, probably say it's conservative. Well, I, yeah, I, I mean, know my could... audience. <clears throat> but if that, so what I consider, let's say, to be extreme and what others may seem to be conservative would mean 
the the vast majority of humanity is going to die unpleasantly and prematurely, uh, and a relatively small fraction of it is going to survive in a planet which is going to be devastated in terms of biodiversity. I mean, you don't really have an Amazon rainforest anymore, and you can say goodbye to all the uh, coral reefs around the world. I mean, it looks as if they're, they're on a one-way ticket to extinction as it is. Um, or at least exploitation of many regions of the, of the earth. And so it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a civilization. The technosphere um, has persisted, it's it survived. But what kind of a world is it? It's a world, you know, de literally denuded of much of its beauty, devastated in terms of its diversity, and not just biodiversity, but cultural diversity. You know, who would really want to live in a world like that? And what's most really most depressing is many people would, because as long as they can watch the TV um, and they can remain comfortable and have enough to eat, that's sufficient for them. So I, I can see how in that respect we can we can both be wrong. We can we can not collapse. But the thing that we get, I don't know if it's any better than collapse. Well, it, 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 yeah, you, th this really is getting down to a, uh, a, a, ma a matter of semantics here. I, I love it. I, I'm sitting here, uh, James, on a 265-acre estate in Vermont and the, uh, the mowing service. I, I love it when stuff like this happens in the middle of my interviews, the mowing service. Uh, decided to pick this 30 minutes to show up here and mow the and, and mow down all the wildflowers on the uh, 265 acre estate in the middle of a discussion about the collapse of global industrial civilization and do, do you still have a sense of humor James it sounds like you do that you're holding on to the your ironic sense of humor and yeah, um I, I had an interview yesterday and somebody asked me something like that, you know, coping mechanisms. And I said satire. I mean, it's it has to be you. you it's I don't mind if it if, if it is a kind of coping mechanism, but it's just absurd. There are so many situations which are absurd or surreal. I mean, one of my favorite novels is Catch-22. Oh, yeah. um, and yes, Today, no, on Tuesday this week, I was in London interviewing the chief executive of this organization called the Committee for Climate Change, which is the official advisor to the UK government on matters on climate change. And every year they, they produce a report, and every year they pretty much conclude that the UK government is useless, even though it's held up as this sort of example of blazing a trail for sustainability. And you I mean, just in the UK, we have this ridiculous situation where the, the environment minister has a legal obligation now to get the country to net zero carbon emissions by the middle of this century, which is a very ambitious target. Still not good enough for the Paris Agreement, but, you know, at least it's going in the same direction. Yet the, the minister for the environment also has a legal obligation to extract as much oil and gas from the North Sea as is economically feasible, because that, you know, that pays the rent, that produces tax income. Yeah, yeah. And so there are, I think that's a great example of just, you know, how dysfunctional our relationship is to the Earth system, because, you know, the Earth system provides everything that we need. It literally grows our food. We, we breathe its air. We drink its water. And through the process of what we think is wealth, we, you know, what we literally think has got value, we are progressively destroying it. We're progressively hacking some instances or examples literally hacking away the life support systems of our of our planet to produce wealth of literally imaginary value you know um so if if that isn't just absurd and surreal and and worthy of ridicule then then i don't know what is and so maybe that does help fend off some of the darker moments yeah the the dark sense of humor is the is the best defense against uh, against the darkness now, 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 James, if, if this line of questioning I'm heading into makes you at all uncomfortable, just tell me to get lost, I guess. I, I, I hear children, while, while we're hearing uh, the, 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 this monster lawnmower here in the background, uh, uh, me, I am hearing children uh, in, in the background on your end of the line, so... Mm -hmm. You are a father, is, is, is that correct? And, and how do you feel as, 
I, I, I just don't know. I, I don't have any children. If I had children, James, I would be a frothing at the mouth, homicidal, suicidal maniac. How does it feel knowing what you know and what you have shared with us? Uh, how does it feel to 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 have children who are going to inherit the the future that you were spelling out uh, five minutes ago? Yeah, so I'm I'm certainly tired enough and poor enough to be a father. So I have kids. I've got twins, and they are eleven now so they're going to be young enough to have the risk of significant environmental change and disruption at some point in their life um, maybe when they're my age right now maybe towards the end of their life um, we need to look down the road you know 70 years and certainly if they have children so my grandchildren so it's, it's certainly the case that until I had children I, I didn't have that obvious emotional link into the future. I didn't, uh, I cared, you know, passionately about certain issues and I cared about the earth and the earth system and biodiversity and, you know, our home planet. But it's not until I had kids that I actually realized that, you know, obviously now, genetically speaking, I've got skin in the game. Uh, and my time horizon for immediate consideration now extends beyond my life. And I can begin to imagine now um, grandchildren. Uh, which, you know, may not be born for another 20 years and then they may live for another, you know, 80 years. So, you know, no, 100 years. So we're well into the, the 21st century. Um, 22nd century. Even, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, you know, you can't help but worry about them because part of your job as a parent is to ensure that you you know provide for your family and that you want them to have a life that is at least good as good as yours there's there's interesting and i think important debate right now as to what extent younger people yeah you know, whether it's you know millennial generation have it are having lives are having the kind of opportunities that someone of my generation i consider myself to be a, like generation x born in the 70s had you know there are many things that i had in terms of you know a permanent job um i i had a you know a pension and a home and stability that just another kind of an economic context uh, younger people don't have they don't expect to buy their own home they don't expect to have um, a permanent job, the tremendous sense of economic precariousness. And then when you add in the possibility of, you know, significant environmental change and disruption, you have to ask, you know, what kind of a world are we living for, for our kids? And so it certainly motivated me to want to not just do the research that I do, but then basically talk about it. So it's been a, it must, it must be about 10 years now. So it was relatively soon after they were born that I sort of realized I've made a conscious decision to want to stick my head up above this parapet or cross this imaginary line which separated academia from activism or at least engagement. Because if I genuinely thought there were risks to them and to other young people and to people who haven't even been born yet, then I wanted to try to do at least something about it. And I suppose that conviction has only got stronger. So. Just in the context of climate change, you know, I can't imagine anything more important that I'd want to spend the rest of my life doing, which would be to try to ensure that we avoid the very worst impacts that could unfold over there and other other people's lives. Okay, well, that leads me. Oh, but well, before I ask my final question, are you ready to share anything about your new book, or is it too early in the in the oh. game? Yeah, the new book. Well, I feel like we're on a chat show now, and I get the book out. And I, um, well, everyone's going to be disappointed because it doesn't exist. The reason um, I'm actually writing the book, I managed to find some time to do it today, is largely a consequence of this Technosphere article. So I've written, I've been writing for a year, you know, um, over five years now, I think. Uh, on various environmental matters, you know, climate change, biodiversity loss. Initially, because I wanted to talk to, about my own research, and I thought people might be interested in it. 
but then um, just sort of um, initially kind of science journalism, but then lately much more kind of um, opinion pieces where I typically uh, rant and rave and, and um, exhibit frustration about the way things are going. And I, you know, I get quite a lot of responses, uh, emails and, you know, messages on social media. Uh, but when I published that piece and it did you know well in terms of the number of people who've what viewed it and it's been shared widely the the response that i got from people was uh, you know unprecedented in the level of engagement and interest so yeah obviously i got a lot of emails from people trying to explain to me that there's no such thing as the greenhouse effect or it's all cosmic rays or i'm i've become deluded or i'm part of a lizard conspiracy or something but i also got lots of emails who said you've kind of captured many of the things or feelings or suspicions that I've had um, and I'm interested in this I want I want to understand more and this generated a whole series of um, interesting conversations some like today um, uh, a podcast or an interview I had an interview yesterday and it just generated interest, right? People were interested, and then I was approached by... It's the story in the, in the history of humanity, James, that you're talking about that. And guys, trust me, go on this link and read this uh, essay. It really does encapsulate everything uh, that I have been trying to say on Collapse Chronicles for the past year, but... but, but uh, James, I, as, as much as I am absolutely enjoying this, we're getting ready to wrap this up, so I am going to wrap it up the same way I do with every one of my interviews. So, so James Dyke, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles for an hour, but you actually had the mainstream media with a microphone in your face saying you have 60 seconds to send the James Dyke message to humanity, uh, out there in the summer of 2019, what would that 60 second sound bite sound like? My sound bite would be that we are dangerously deluded about the stories that we're telling ourselves by which we think we're going to avoid ecological and climate collapse. We're telling us a story that growth is going to solve all of humanity's problems, including all the problems that growth itself produces. We are invoking uh, magical thinking to imagine that we can suck out enormous amounts of carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere and store it for centuries, if not thousands of years. And we're deluding ourselves if we think that the destruction, the continual piling of the wrecking ball through the biosphere that humans have been undertaking for at least a century now is not going to produce significant impacts. We need to radically reevaluate just what it is that our civilization is for, what we think is of value, what we think is of of uh, purpose and beauty, and then use that as a basis for ensuring that the seven and a half billion people alive now, and then the nine billion in just a few decades, are going to have lives which are safe, secure, and flourishing, and that we can do the best to be good and fair custodians of this precious biosphere. Well, there you go. That was that. It sounds like you've been asked that question before. Uh, anyway, uh, J James Dyke, I absolutely stick around for a minute after we wrap this up, so we can uh, we can talk. But right now, guys, uh, I hate to say this, but we have got to say uh, goodbye to James. And and James Dyke, all I can say is thank you very much for taking an hour out of your busy schedule, and more importantly, thank you for the job you are doing, uh, talking about the biggest story in the history of humanity. Your work is appreciated and keep up the good fight. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Bye guys.